Professor, three, two, one. Uh, sir, over to you. You can start the session. Okay. So good evening, one and all. Uh, today it's very good evening. Like uh, because uh, we are going to discuss one of the most uh, common presentation what we see in day-to-day -day practice, not only in uh, the field of respiratory medicine. And uh, as of now, we are in the COVID era. So I think uh, this management of cough, uh, cough uh, should be known to each and every practitioner, not only uh, pulmonologist, also general physician, general practitioners. Uh, they should follow a unique and uh, you know universal guidelines so that uh, you know the best care to be uh, uh, can be given to all the patients who present with cough. So. With much of time uh, in this presentation, what we are going to discuss? So we are going to discuss what are the new uh, things that's there for the management of cough uh, in the present year, and also we are going to discuss one of the most uh, uh, important guidelines that is ERS guidelines uh, that has been um, uh, released for the uh, diagnosis and management of chronic cough in adults and children. And at the same time, we are going to discuss uh, about uh, 2019 NICE guidelines on management of cough and how it differs from the Indian consensus statement for the management of cough at the primary care setting and also a little bit about 2018 chest guidelines. So all these guidelines, what they are telling uh, about the management of cough, which is one of the most common symptoms that what we see in day-to-day -day practice. And whether we are following that guidelines or not, let's see at the end of this uh, uh, you know, discussion. See, as you know, uh, the cough is one of the uh, most uh, common symptom. What we see in day to day practice, it can present as a, uh, uh, present the acute phase or the present the acute subacute phase or the chronic phase. Uh, this is one of the important uh, paper that is published in Asia Pacific Allergy uh, Journal. That's one of the official journal of uh, uh, APACI. So they have discussed how this chronic cough would have an impact and how it. Uh, uh, increase the disease burden of these patients. So you could see the patient experience, it has a potential impact of social isolation. It is also having an impact of, uh, you know, emotional aspect and also economic impact also is there. So when the patient presents to you with the chronic of all these things needs to be addressed, not only, you know, you should use symptomatic uh, treatment. Uh, the first and foremost thing that you should do is any cough, you should do a proper workup. Because the cough cannot be managed symptomatically because cough may be a uh, you know um, common symptom, but it may be uh, it may be a, one of the first sign for underlying serious disease, or it may be a, a very common symptom. Maybe this cough secondary to any upper respiratory tract infection, secondary to viral uh, uh, viral uh, causes. But even after that, also a proper workup should be done. Uh, to rule out the common causes of um, chronic cough or acute cough, then you can go ahead with the symptomatic management. So the outstanding impact of chronic cough is social isolation. The impact is perhaps bigger than ever due to COVID-19 pandemic. The frequent symptom of post-COVID syndrome is chronic cough. So this is one of the important paper uh, that is uh, uh, that was published in Neurology Therapy Journal in 2021. Uh, 2021. Uh, so this on transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation as a treatment for neuropathy cough, a tolerability and feasibility study. So this is a tense, uh, it's a transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation, electrical nerve stimulation. It's a form of electroanalgesia used for neuropathic pain disorders, basically used in uh, the field of neurology. So re in patients, the refractory chronic cough or neuropathy cough, maybe physiologically, it is similar to other neuropathic pain conditions. This study explored the tolerability and feasibility of using TENS, that is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, as a potential therapy for neuropathic cough, that is in, the, in that it's presenting as chronic cough. So laryngeal TENS was well tolerated by all the patients. The adverse effects included brief neck discomfort with increasing tense, uh, tense intensity and the event of mild post-treatment hostess. So the self reporter scores are uh, very good with tense. Why I'm discussing all these things? Because, you know, there are particular group of patients where we label it as idiopathic cough syndrome. So more than 20 to 30% of cases where we work up all the causes, uh, but uh, we can't find out not even a single etiology fitting into the uh, one of the reason for chronic cough. In this group of patients, because of chronic cough, they will get irritated. And all the social impact, emotional impact, all these things will happen to the patient. And this will impact uh, very badly uh, uh, both to the patients 
and also to the family members. So these group of patients, we are in search of any additional therapies. And this is one of the new therapy which can be tried, which was used in uh, the field of neurology. So first we will discuss what are the, uh, what are the, what is the ERS statement on this management of chronic cough, both in adults and pediatric population. As you all know, the cough is one of the most important vital. It's a protective reflex, which prevents our airway uh, from the secretions and also it enhances the airway clearance. It is one of the natural reflex. It is one of the protective reflex. It prevents the airway from flooding of all the secretions. And also it prevents, uh, it, it also enhances the airway clearance. Maybe a dust, maybe anything which enters the airway. The cough should be a, a, one of the important reflex which clears all the substances from there. So pathologically, excessive and protracted cough is a common uh, you know, uh, symptom and is one of the disabling complaint. Roughly around 5 to 10% of the population presents to you with this symptom. When severe, major decrement in the quality of life with comorbidities such as incontinence, you could always see a patient, particularly female patient, obese patients, uh, you know, uh, postpartum patients, all these patients typically have a hacking cough. Along with that, with the increase in the cough, they also complain of incontinence. And some patients will get a cough syncope, typically commonly seen in males, and dysphonia. These are the other comorbidities associated with the chronic cough. So how do you classify cough? This is very, very important because classification will help you to narrow the diagnosis, narrow the differential diagnosis. So cough can be classified based on the duration, acute cough, subacute cough, and chronic cough. Any cough which lasts less than three weeks is termed as acute cough. And any cough which lasts for three to eight weeks, that is up to two months, it is called as a subacute cough. Any cough which is more than two months, that is more than eight weeks, is termed as chronic cough. So once again, a cough is a sudden, repetitively occurring protective reflex, which helps to clear our airways from the fluids, from irritant particles, from foreign particles or foreign bodies, and also from the microbes. A cough is classified once again three categories. Once I'm repeating, acute subacute cough. Acute is less than three weeks. Subacute three to eight weeks, and chronic is more than eight weeks. So let's discuss what are the common causes that we see in day-to-day -day practice, particularly in adults, which can present as an acute cough. Okay. So the chest classifications of acute, subacute, chronic cough, and associated management algorithms that were based on the duration of cough, which is very much helpful in diagnosing and also in treating the cough. Uh, two of the three studies define acute cough in the method section as less than three weeks. The third study defined as no more than 28 days. So actually this terminology, like uh, the, some studies, they mentioned acute cough uh, as uh, any cough which presents in the uh, less than one month. So, but most of the studies were just telling acute cough, anything that is less than three weeks. The commonest scenario, the commonest causes of acute cough were respiratory infection, most likely a viral cause followed by exacerbation of underlying chronic lung disease what the patient is having. That is either asthma or COPD or any patient who presents with signs of foci of infection, we should think of pneumonia. Either it's a community of pneumonia or it is other forms of pneumonia. The commonest cause of acute cough includes upper respiratory tract infection, predominantly a viral cause, maybe a bacterial one, and pneumonia, underlying lung disease like asthma, Acute cough may be a symptom of underlying serious illness like a congestive cardiac failure. Typically, these patients usually presents with other symptoms of congestive cardiac failure other, uh, along with the cough. But sometimes I have seen some cases, they initially presents with only cough. This congestive cardiac failure patients along with the cough, they also have dyspnea. And typically they'll have a nocturnal, uh, they have orthopnea and PND. And also they have a worsening of cough on lying down. Particularly, the cough worsens in the night time. There is a nocturnal cough. You will see in a case of congestive cardiac failure. They will also have other futures of cardiac failure. That is, uh, you know, they will have uh, futures of orthopnea, PND. They will have a decreased urine output. They will have a distension of abdomen. They will have other signs like uh, you will have a, uh, uh, you will have along with the acute cough. Pulmonary embolism. Even though pulmonary embolism can present to you with the dyspnea as the commonest uh, presentation, Sometimes, you know, I have seen a uh, lot of cases with only cough, chronic cough as a presentation of pulmonary embolism. When you work up the case, so what they will tell is that they had dyspnea uh, initially, but after that only cough worsens. This may be due to underlying pulmonary infarct, which is one of the complications or which is one of the, uh, you know, sequelae of pulmonary embolism. Uh, it is because of the segmental embolus. And foreign body aspiration, of course, this is very common in children 
when you are seeing adults for immediate aspiration is commonly seen in those patients who have altered sensorium those patient under the influence of any alcohol or any, or any uh, drug influence so they have a history of foreign body aspiration you should think of foreign body aspiration as one of the cause of acute cough so what's the algorithm algorithm of management of acute cough as per their guidelines so any patient who presents with acute cough you should always take a meticulous history try to focus where is the problem and do a very good physical examination ask about the environmental and occupation very very important any history of exposure uh, environmental triggers if the patient already have any history of allergy or atopy or history of asthmatic attacks you should ask history of any environmental exposure to any triggers environmental triggers that is one of the important issue that you should note and occupational factors so there are certain occupational uh, you know hazards that can increase leads to increase in the symptoms of underlying uh, underlying pathology or that can itself lead to the symptoms for example if the patient works in a chemical factory or exposure to any acids or alkalis that can trigger acute cough or if the patient exposed to any dust or any patient exposed to any uh, yeast if you if he is uh, working in a bakery or if he is working in any other dust exposure so this can trigger his underlying hyperactive airway disease that can trigger an episode of uh, attack of asthma so this all history has to be noted in your case and history of uh, travel to any particular areas all these things to be done and relevant investigation has to be asked for so after taking all this history and physical examination and also your uh, environmental history taking exposure history taking and occupational factors then if you come to a conclusion that it is an, a non life threatening diagnosis this is very important i initially only i told you cough may be a sign of common disease cough may be a sign of underlying serious disease the the main aim of all the physician is that a cough should not be under a sign of underlying serious illness or life threatening diagnosis that is a thing that you should rule out because cough anyway it's going to settle or is going to settle with time or going to settle with your symptomatic therapy that's not an important thing but you should rule out the di uh, differential diagnosis for underlying serious illness with your history so if it is a non life threatening diagnosis exacerbation of pre existing condition either asthma or bronchiectasis or upper airway cough syndrome this is a new terminology it's not a new terminology uh, five years before only uh, like any patient who have a post nasal drip the post nasal drip terminology is totally an absolute terminology so in this this group of patient we are using nowadays pac that is upper airway cough syndrome a uh, copd or other underlying disease so all these things has to be ruled out if you think that it is a life threatening diagnosis if it is a pneumonia if it is a exacerbation of underlying asthma or copd or if you think it is a pulmonary embolism particularly the patient having a risk factor of embolism or any patient with a history of cardiac failure or other serious disease evaluate and treat the disease first don't symptomatically uh, treat the cough and if you think it is a non life threatening diagnosis is not because of exacerbation of pre existing disease if you think it is infectious then you have to rule out whether it is upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract so upper respiratory tract infection may be acute sinusitis acute pharyngitis or pharyngo uh, laryngitis all these things you should rule out if it is ela if it is upper respiratory tract infection then you should give only symptomatic therapy there is no need to uh, treat if it is a viral illness uh, if it is a lower respiratory tract infection then think of uh, it is because of acute bronchitis or it is because of pertussis pertussis is not very common in our uh, uh in our uh, you know clinical scenario in our uh, in our in our area particularly in adults consider tb in endemic areas or high risk population that you can just ask one question sir uh, tb you should yes you should think of tb because as per recent rntsb guidelines any patient who presents with a cough more than 2 weeks you should always think of tuberculosis as a first diagnosis particularly in endemic areas but i am not telling you to think tb for all the patients because there are other diagnosis hyperactive airway disease and other diagnoses also very one of the common causes that we see in day to day practice but in india tuberculosis incidence is very common prevalence is very common so that's why you just consider tb for any patient who are having history of cough for more than 2 weeks but this is not a hard and fast rule the, uh, even the duration can be reduced uh, if any patient who are having history of cough uh, who is having history of cough less than a one week less than a week also if at in the presence of comorbidities like uh, the patient uh, if the patient is a known case of type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes mellitus or the patient is having any history of immunosuppressive uh, conditions or immunosuppressive underlying diseases or the patient is a chronic smoker so all these patients this is not a hard and fast rule that you should have a cut off of two weeks any cough less than one week also you can work out for tuberculosis so algorithm for the management of acute cough what are the red flags you should see 
red flags is the thing that you should always carefully evaluate this patient because this indicates underlying serious disease any cough with hemoptysis any cough with hemoptysis any patient with cough acute cough who is a smoker more than 40 years of age with a new cough or change in the quality of cough or change in the uh, you know intensity of cough or associated with any voice disturbance associated with any hoarseness of voice you should think of underlying disease adults aged between 50 to 80 years of age who had 30 pack year of smoking history or who currently continues to smoke or who have a quit within past 15 years so indirectly i am telling any patient who is who are having history of chronic smoking you should always think of underlying disease don't treat it light uh, don't take it lightly and treat only cough a prominent dystonia especially at rest or at night any patient with presence of the hoarseness of voice or any patient with systemic symptoms like fever weight loss a peripheral edema with weight gain or troubles on swallowing or while eating or drinking all these things to be noted any patient with history of vomiting along with the cough any patient with history of recurrent pneumonia recurrent pneumonia that means that you are missing out something that that has to be noted and abnormal respiratory inflammation or abnormal chest radiogram you know, coincides with the duration of cough all these things is a red flag that you should uh, note for the management of acute cough remainders check all these things when you are focusing on the case routinely assess the quality of cough quality of life associated with the cough or severity of cough with valid tool see actually cough severity assessment we are not doing properly in india but actually it has to be done because then only you can assess the, the response to the therapy for any symptom uh, we should assess the therapy so the patient can only assess but we don't have any qualitative quantitative or qualitative assessment tools uh, commonly being used nowadays in india but there are a lot of tools we can use visual analog scale uh, we can use cough scores lot of cough score there are lichest cough scores there there are different cough scoring systems are there ec scores are there so this can be used in our clinical practice to assess the response to a therapy and to assess the seriousness of the issue with the cough routinely follow up the patient uh, in 4 to 6 weeks so this is one of the uh, you know uh, one of the uh, score or now the scale that you can use to assess the quality of life associated with the cough severity so a is a the, the a, a scale is for the assessment of cough severity the b scale is assessment of the quality of life associated with the severe cough you could see it is a score that patient can only note uh, you know based on their response this is actually a, a expansion of vas that is visual analog scale you could see worst possible cough if they can give uh, 10 marks for it uh, very severe cough they can do 8 marks severe cough they can be 6 marks based on that scoring we can assess the severity so taking time intensity distress and all these things for the past one week you can assess the scoring for the quality of life also worst possible problem very severe problem severe problem moderate problem how commonly it affects your day to day uh, activity all these things can be scored Uh, score up to 10 can be given up to 0 so from 0 to 10 they can uh, give a score for each point and you can calculate the uh, you know severity and also you can assess the overall quality of life associated with cough so what nice guidelines is telling about uh, the management of uh, chronic cough or acute cough sorry acute cough so nice guidelines acute cough or self limiting but can last up up to 3 to 4 weeks so you can just note this point up to 4 weeks also we can tell uh, 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 it has acute cough so antibiotics makes a little difference to how long a cough last usually caused by viral upper respiratory infection such as cold or flu also caused by acute bronchitis that is lrta which is usually viral but can be bacterial so what are the what are the recommendations from nice so you could see any patient acute cough if you think if it is urt and, not, and the patient is not systematically very unwell there is no high risk of complications don't give any antibody and necessarily you should not give antibody for any patient with urt if you think acute bronchitis is one of the differential diagnoses and not systematically very unwell or not at the high risk of any complications uh, complications once again do not routinely offer any antibody for this patient also if any patient who presents with acute cough having high risk of complications having high risk of underlying comorbidities definitely if think you can just think of uh, giving an immediate antibiotic and and or a backup antibiotic prescription if the patient worsens also they can just take antibiotic systematically unwell if you just on exam if you feel that patient is not good at the face to face examination offer an immediate antibiotic so advice so what do, if you are thinking of urta if you are not offering any antibiotic the usual course of acute cough is up to usually up to 2 to 3 weeks it will settle out managing symptoms with the self care when to seek medical help that you should explain for example if, if the symptom worsens rapidly or significantly which is not improving after 3 weeks also 
symptomatic after your symptomatic therapy or uh, after their therapy so or the patient becomes systematically unwell or the patient throws fever or the patient have other systemic symptoms uh, ask the patient to come and review once again if antibiotics are not prescribed advise why not uh, advise why not why you should always explain to the patient with an antibiotic advise are all the possible serious adverse effects or possible adverse effect including diarrhea so this is very common like in india the commonest antibiotic what we prescribe is a penicillin derivative usually amoxicillin so the commonest thing is that amoxicillin or ampicillin you will see the diarrhea as one of the possible adverse effect so always explain uh, this as one of the uh, possibility or any broad spectrum antibiotic if you give uh, uh, for long duration unnecessarily that can also give gives you to the rise of antibiotic as mm-hmm. diarrhea and it can also lead to some serious complications so that also has to be explained to the patient and most important thing when you are seeing upper respiratory tract uh, uh, infection urta don't hover a mucolytic so any upper respiratory tract infections you know upper respiratory tract is devoid of all your mucus producing the goblet cells and all this uh, they are very less in number when you see when you see the lower respiratory tract the number of goblet cell mucus glands is high when you see the upper respiratory tract all these things are very less so don't give any mucolytic unnecessarily for this group of patients so don't offer any oral or inhaled bronchodilator if you think the problem is in the upper respiratory tract or if it is upper respiratory tract infection and don't unnecessarily give any anti uh, oral corticosteroid or nail corticosteroid unless otherwise it is strongly indicated so reassess if symptoms worsens rapidly or significantly taking a cut off think of alternative diagnosis also uh, any symptoms suggest you of underlying serious disease you should think and any foci of sepsis also you should think so all these things so um, so refer to a hospital so if a patient uh, like if you are you know primary care setting if you think that the patient is having a, a, a having worsening of their symptoms definitely you should refer to a specialty center if, if you think that focus of uh, infection anywhere in the lungs it's a focus of sepsis or if you think uh, a diagnosis may be a pulmonary embolism try to refer to a tertiary care center uh, and get an opinion from a specialist a self care what nice guidelines telling you, they can manage their own uh, symptoms symptoms following uh, which have a limited evidence of benefit for the relief of cough symptoms if you think that nothing can be given so they can try honey particularly in people aged over one year this all these things have uh, low quality of evidence based on the various uh, trials and pelargonium which is one of the herbal medicine that is uh, you know recommended in uh, uh, nice i don't know about this uh, that can be given in uh, people over 12 years or old over over the counter cough medicines contain expectorant dofenacin in people with age more than 12 years you can try gofenacin it may be efficacious in some patient over the counter cough medicine containing any cough suppressants but beware of codeine except codeine you can try dexamethorphan for that you can try any other drugs but don't give codeine unnecessarily because people will misuse it in people aged 12 years or over with non persistent cough or without excessive without excessive secretions you can try all these things so limited evidence suggest antihistamines decongestant and cough medicine contain codeine do not help to help for your cough symptoms but patient may have a symptomatic relief in some group of patients but don't prescribe unnecessarily uh, this group of medicines for all the patients so based on the nice guidelines the antibiotics for adults age over the 80 18 years or over if you think infectious cough as one of the uh, one of the uh, predominant uh, uh, you know etiology for your acute cough Uh, their first choice is doxycycline 200 mg first day then 100 mg once a day for four days five days course in total what are the other alternative choices in india commonly what we are using is amoxicillin 500 mg three times a day for five days and clarithromycin 250 mg to 500 mg twice daily for five days very important when you are giving clarithromycin as per the you know uh, fda warning there is an uh, two years back fda has warned Uh, regarding the use of clarithromycin particularly those patient who are debilitated and those patient who are having underlying cardiac disease underlying ischemic heart disease having a poor cardiac reserve so don't uh, loosely prescribe this clarithromycin that's very important and erythromycin once again 250 to 500 mg four times a day or 500 mg to 1000 mg twice a day for five days so one second macrolides and penicillin are the drug of choice this is for pneumonia this is for lrta this is for uh, urta second to bacterial uh, causes you can just give it uh according to them first choice is doxycycline but in india we use uh, as per our guidelines moxil and uh, you know macrolide can be given uh, these are the cough suppressants uh, we are going to discuss based on their nice recommendations codeine was no more effective than placebo based on various studies either as a single dose of 30 mg or in a total daily dose of 120 mg that is 30 mg four times a day in reducing cough symptoms in adults with acute cough as per the you know there is a low coverage evidence that i already described in the last slide 
uh, in the last slide at a single dose of codeine 50 mg was no more effective than placebo in reducing cough symptoms at 90 minutes in adults with acute cough one second low cavity evidence a codeine as a single dose at the bedtime 10 mg in 5 ml plus guanfenesin for 3 nights was no more effective than placebo in reducing cough score on day 3 in children with acute cough ultimately what i am trying to tell is that try to prescribe this symptomatic medicines which are very safe uh which are having a less addictive potential that that's the thing that wow, that i just want to convey you all because the codeine is you know loosely prescribed drug but as per the evidence as per the literature evidence you see that it is not having a much impact uh in uh, reducing the cough symptoms particularly in adults and also in pediatric population so now we are going to discuss discuss about dextromethorphan dextromethorphan is another common uh, you know uh, 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 substance that is that you could you can see in most of the cough syrups that that is being used commonly in india and also in western countries you could see dextromethorphan as a as a single uh, 30 mg dose was no more effective than placebo for reduction in cough frequency or reduction in cough severity in one rct of adults with acute cough very low quality evidence however in another rct a single dose that is 30 mg of dextromethorphan uh, reduces significantly reduces the cough counts not further defined in adults so they they could uh, make out the difference of cough counts between a uh, uh, placebo and dexamethorphan uh, once again it's a low quality evidence so one rct is in favor of using a dexamethorphan single dose a third rct was found that um, a single 30 mg dose of dexamethorphan significantly reduced the cough bouts so average difference you could see the cough competence cough effort cough latency all these things have been reduced uh, when compared to placebo in patients with acute cough so so what ultimately we could uh, gain from all these studies is that dexamethorphan when compared to codeine can be given can be given in particular group of population so very important uh, you know derivative that what, what we going to discuss now is the usage of leoclopracetin uh, which is be commonly used for the past 3 uh, uh, to 5 years so the efficacy and safety of leoclopracetin in the treatment of dry cough a prospective observed study leoclopracetin is a unique molecule which can suppress the cough in two ways it can act in the peripheral cough receptors it can act in the central cough receptor at the central bulbar cough receptors can be very much acted with uh, levoclopracetin in suppressing the cough um, and also improving the quality of life not at the cost of other adverse effects okay so basically the adverse effect and other you know sedation and all these potentials are uh, somewhat less in levoclopracetin when compared to dextromethorphan codeine uh, this is a study of uh, total 100 patients were enrolled in the study Leoclopracetin was found to be so effective and safe in the management of dry cough. The mean dose of cough severity, cough frequency, and night disruption due to cough, nighttime awakening due to cough, was significantly reduced from baseline to day 14, which is you could see the p-value, which is very very significant. So a significant reduction in the severity scores, frequency of cough and sleep disruption was reported with the overall improvement of quality of life as per the quality of life questionnaires. so so this study is very important this was published in api uh, in the year 2018 so the uh, they assess the efficacy and safety of leoclopracetin in acute cough that is treatment of dry cough so from this study uh, we could come to a conclusion that leoclopracetin is very good and uh, it is safe and effective in the management of dry cough so other expectant medicines as i already described gofenesin reduces cough symptoms in adults and young patients with acute cough or upper respiratory tract inf infection with no increase in adverse effects the clinical significance of any benefit is unclear but the committee agreed the nice committee agreed that the people over 12 years may wish to try try cough medicines containing gofenesin for the treatment of acute cough once again gofenesin is an expectant so i don't uh, want you people to unnecessarily prescribe expectant particularly a patient with a dry cough so these are the recommendations for the chest for outpatient adults with acute cough as suspected pneumonia we suggest that there is no need for routine microbiological testing that means that if you think that pneumonia is not severe can be managed the opd basis there is no need to do any sputum analysis at all so rimas microbiological testing should be considered if the results may change or warrant or may result in the change of therapy that means that if is it worthwhile to do a microbiology testing is it worthwhile to wait for the results before starting therapy so otherwise you can give a common empirical therapy for all the patients with suspected pneumonia so when the patient is not very sick there are a lot of different scores are there there are different scores of the curve 65 
all these different scores are there. Easy scores are there. So these scores can be assessed, and if the patient can be managed at OPT, uh, OPT level, you can just prescribe the empirical therapy. For outpatient adults with acute cough, we suggest use of empirical antibiotic as per the local and national guidelines when the pneumonia is suspected in settings where imaging cannot be obtained. For outpatients adults with acute cough, no clinical radiographic evidence of pneumonia. When the vital signs and lug examination on respiratory examinations were normal, so we do not suggest the routine use of antibiotics. That means that if there is no focus of infection, there is no evidence of pneumonia, don't use any antibiotic unnecessarily for this group of patients. This was the recommendation. This is the recommendation that is uh, given by CHEST. So the most important scenario that what we see nowadays is the COVID-19 cough. As you all know, we are in the end of, uh, you know, second um, wave of um, COVID-19. So you could see uh, the commonest presentation be a fever, uh, maybe a, a cough. The cough may present, uh, they, they may present to you with the cough in the early phase or in the late phase. But uh, uh, any cough which is there after five days or exactly if you ask me at the end of one week, any cough which is a dry and harking cough is another serious sign. That means that you got a significant lung involvement. So after that, you will have a dip in saturation. That patient has to be picked up. But sometimes you may see this cough even day one or day two also because of upper respiratory involvement, because of post nasal dripping and all. So these things has to be clinically assessed uh, when you are seeing a COVID-19 patient. And uh, shortness of breath, another serious sign along with the cough that you should note in any patient with the COVID-19. Vomiting, diarrhea, and other atypical manifestations of what we are seeing, the second wave more when compared to the first wave. So, as you all know, COVID virus, that is coronavirus, is a family of virus that affects the respiratory attack. It can cause a disease from common cold up to serious pneumonia, to AI, which can progress to ARDS. This virus usually lives in bats and other wild animals, transmitting to humans directly or indirectly. So, because the major mode of spread will be respiratory droplets, initially it was thought it was thought it can spread by even touch or contact, but now the most common route uh, uh, that uh, that was described in most that was described in most of the papers and uh, that was accepted widely in all the literature that it is mainly transmitted by respiratory droplets by close contact. So the common presentations: high grade fever or high fever, not necessarily high fever. You may get a low grade fever commonly in uh, uh, COVID, vomiting and diarrhea, coughing after two to five to seven days. The patient may have a dry cough and diarrhea in some patients. And worse, the most important and dangerous symptom is pneumonia. Uh, you should always suspect any patient who have a worsening of cough with uh, increasing fever, with uh, episodes of fever, along with uh, focal signs of pneumonia. Uh, so this patient has to be taken care of properly in any patient who are, who are having COVID-19. So, so most of the patients, they usually present within 3 to 14 days Median incubation will be around five days after a con of, after a contact. So most patients will be in this phase. They do not progress to pneumonia phase. So this is the this was the common presentation what we saw in first wave. But uh, in second wave, most of the patients have some form of symptom, mild symptoms, asymptomatic. Uh, uh, you know, a group of people that uh, uh, we could not uh, find a lot of patients in this phase. That is second wave. So prodromal symptoms. What we usually see is a fever, cough. Uh, sore throat, arthralgia, myalgia, and J symptoms like diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So typically they usually last for one to seven days. So hydroxychloroquine, this actually these slides are old. Actually, uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have no role in the management of uh, COVID-19 as per the recent literature. Uh, only symptomatic management, but there is no evidence of pneumonia. You, do, you should treat symptomatically. You should ask the patient to get hydrated, give paracetamol, all these things. If the patient having any focus of uh, pneumonia, if you think pneumonia is, uh, is there, Persistent or recurrent episodes of fever, more lethargy, and increased inflammatory markers, chest X-ray or any radiological picture suggest you of uh, pneumonia, or any patient who are having increased parameters, inflammatory markers, having tachypnea, worsening hacking cough along with dyspnea, deterioration, all these things. Typically, at the end of one week, you see all these things. So, this group of patients, you should catch hold of that patient and uh, treat them with uh, steroids and all this uh, other um, other immunomodulators that what we have. So COVID-19 cough, this is one of the data uh, that is a retrospective analysis of data uh, from 4,203 patients, mostly from China, identified fever, cough, and dyspnea as, well as the most common clinical symptoms. Hypertension, cardiovascular diabetes are the most common comorbidities. The most common reported symptom in children were fever and cough. One second. So the manifestation of COVID-19, when you compare with other viral bacterial pneumonias, you could see the viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, COVID-19. So the usually, uh, you know, COVID-19, they present the flow-grade fever, 
dry cough or the predominant symptom and uh, chest CT as you all know that GGOs and consolidation, PCP movement to the late stage, advanced lesions, all these are common in COVID-19. So the thing should be noted. So viral pneumonia, the first initial symptom will be high grade fever, cough, sore throat, and myalgia, whereas uh, other viral pneumonia, you will see high grade fever, whereas in COVID-19, you typically see the low grade fever. Very few patients will see the high grade fever, dry cough or the predominant symptom. Whereas in bacterial pneumonia, you see the nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, sore throat and uh, uh, symptoms are usually mild and common. And as you all know, the commonest uh, URTA, that, uh, that viral coryza, uh, maybe with the flu, you will see that all this uh, nasal, nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, the URTA symptoms, that is nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea is very common in flu when compared to COVID-19. So next we come to subacute cough in adults. So when you see subacute cough in adults, that, that is we are discussing uh, a patient who presents with cough uh, of duration three weeks to six weeks. By good cough, once again, you should think of pneumonias or exacerbation of underlying underlying diseases, lung disease or heart disease, post-infectious. And once again, you need to take a medical history taking and examination uh, and exposure to environmental uh, other environmental triggers or occupational factors, travel exposure, all these things has to be noted. If it is non-infectious, work out for comic, uh, chronic cough. If it is a post-infectious or life-threatening diagnosis, once again, you rule out all the serious illness. And then if you are living in an endemic area as in a country like India, definitely uh, you should rule out tuberculosis as one of the possible differential diagnosis. If subacute cough, it is a new onset or exacerbation of previous condition that you should rule out. So the commonest uh, etiologies that you should rule out is upper airway cough syndrome, underlying uh, exacerbation of uh, asthma, or uh, GRD, bronchitis, bronchitis, and other causes. So in bronchitis, there are two phases that you should see. NA, EB, it's a terminal. There's non-asthmatic histoplasmic bronchitis. It's a separate entity. This is another commonest presentation that what we see in day-to-day -day practice. A patient presents a subacute cough. After ruling out all the diagnosis, if you think that the patient have a history of allergy or atrophy or any foci or any history, suggest you of uh, atrophy or any symptoms of recurrent uh, rhinitis or uh, sneezing, or any uh, or only cough only as a presentation after ruling out all these things you can think of nib as one of the differential diagnosis most important thing last slide only i discussed all the red flags has to be once again uh, uh, to be noted for this group of patients also hemoptysis any patient history of smoking having significant pachyas prominent disney and hosts of voice any patient systemic focus of symptoms has to be noted even in sub patients with subacute cough so routinely you assess the same thing so you look for hemoptysis, you, you just uh, note uh, whether the patient is a smoker, whether the chronic smoker with significant uh, smoking index or a pachyas, uh, prominent dyspnea along with hosts of voice, any systemic foci of symptoms, troublesome swallowing, vomiting, history of recurrent pneumonia, any abnormal chest x-ray and abnormal radiographic finding or clinical examination, all these things has to be noted that are considered as a red flags when you are, when you are uh, seeing a patient with a good cough. Now, the most important part of discussion is chronic cough. It's one of the commonest problem what we see day-to-day -day practice. Even after doing an extensive analysis or extensive investigations, uh, most of the times uh, we could not uh, uh, find out the etiology for chronic cough, but these patients are very difficult to treat. Especially there are around 30, 20 to 30 percent of cases. Definitely it's a real challenge for most of the physicians. So the chronic cough, coughing is actually good for the survival of species. As you know, that is one of the protective reflex. It clears your upper airway or airway from the secretions. It is a complicated process. It has three phases. Inspiratory, uh, you know, uh, so cough, typical cough will be like this. So you have to take a deep inspiration, hold the breath, and then because of the contraction of abdominal muscles and contraction of chest wall muscle, and <coughs> because of the sudden closure of glottis and forcing the air, because of the contraction of all your muscles forcing your air against the close glottis. So this will generate a pressure and pushes out, pushes out all your stations and dust, all the particles from your airway. So this is one of the good reflex that uh, God has given to us. So most of the patients in a chronic cough, uh, actually, you know, the any reflex will have a receptor. So in a cough reflex, they will have a afferent, they will have a, uh, 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 they will have a receptor, they will have a afferent, they will have a center, they will have a front. Okay, afferent will change based on the area of involvement. 
you know when you are having cough second to post nasal drip or sinusitis when you are have a cough second to pharyngitis when you are a cough and uh, because of bronchitis afferent is totally different afferent most of the times it will be vagus now afferent may be a vagus may be a gloss of pharyngeal may be a trigeminal if anything it involves the face so this will stimulate uh, get stimulated when the receptors are stimulated once again receptors we can classify cough receptors are rapidly adapting receptors slow adapting receptors and then c fibers so rapidly adapting receptors can be stimulated by exposure to any dust can be stimulated by any noxious substance like acid alkali and all these things okay uh, slow adapting receptors usually uh, get stimulated by exposure to capsaicin and all this like any noxious substances all this so uh, this cough reflex uh, you know this is a uh, uh, th this is a uh, this is the transient receptor potential vanillaid 1 this is a capsaicin receptor uh this has been uh, uh, uh recently been analyzed for the patients uh, with a chronic cough you know uh, any drug which can potentially act on this uh, uh, receptor can suppress the chronic cough so this transient receptor potential vanilla that's trp v1 receptor it's a capsaicin receptor uh, which which can trigger the cough reflex through the c fibers very important this this receptor can trigger the cough reflex through c fibers you could see here these are the Uh, this is the cell surface these are the receptor trp1 receptor and cgrp receptor so because of the rar c fibers this stimulation of this receptor secondary to exposure to capsaicin or noxious noxious particles so this will stimulate the c fibers and this will stimulate the cerebral cortex and this will stimulate the brain stem nts relay neurons this is a cough a central cough generator so this will stimulate the phrenic nerve spinal motor nerve and deferent laryngeal nerve this will once again stimulate the diaphragm uh, intercostal muscle laryngeal abdominal muscles these this should all these muscles should contract should generate a cough, good cough reflex in addition to it you could see that c fibers c fibers can be stimulated by trp1 cgr receptors and other receptors also c fibers stimulated rapid adaptive receptors are usually distributed immediately beneath the airways immediately beneath the mucosal airways these are the commonly uh, stimulated receptors second to any noxious particles or stimuli the causes of chronic cough includes uh, usually uh, uh, maybe upper respiratory tract uh, infection this you I, i already told you upper respiratory infection even with or without treatment it gradually settles within a matter of 2 to 3 weeks maximum you can get up to 3 weeks after 3 weeks definitely you should have a good work up and upper airway cough syndrome the commonest presentation you see in daily day practice any patient will have a post nasal drip having continuous cough definitely you should think of upper airway cough syndrome as inhibitor use of certain drugs this hydrogenic cough use of certain drugs the commonly implicated drugs are as inhibitors actually uh, this as inhibitors can potentially induce a new cough or as inhibitors can aggravate the present uh, aggravate the already existing scenario so that's why any patient who had a worsening of cough so definitely uh, you should advise the patient and ask the patient to consult a physician or cardiologist to change this as inhibitors this as inhibitors can aggravate the uh, existing cough and uh, most important uh, etiology that you should rule is tb any patient who presents with acute subacute chronic cough when any cough more than 2 weeks already told you first thing you should rule out tb mm, and other environmental exposure post infectious cough non asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis also you should rule out any uh, exacerbation of underlying diseases Uh, that is congestive cardiac failure or uh, bronchial asthma or exacerbation of COPD all these things has to be noted GRD any patient who have a typical cough and the cough associated with the reflex uh, but you know sometimes uh, we will uh, we are seeing this scenario commonly patient presents with only chronic cough uh, they don't usually don't give history of any reflex or any belching or something like that when you ask the history only they will tell otherwise they won't tell so grd is one of the hidden potential cause for any patient with a chronic cough that you should note so all these patients once again i'm repeating very good clinical history and physical examination is very important symptom oriented physical examination is performed for the following classification of cough is very important identification of etiological factors also plays a major role evaluation and ruling out of common causes of cough that is grd and cough variant asthma sometimes cough variant asthma why it is described a cough variant asthma here in this group of asthmatic, asthmatic patients the patient presents only cough 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 they won't have a, they, they usually won't have a dyspnea they usually won't have any history of wheezing episodes as is reported most commonly by our patients so they presents with only cough, cough. so how to how to diagnose is when you do a spirometry easily you can just see you can see the reversibility of all these things you can uh, you can uh, very well do pheno also 
uh, even though pheno is not uh, accepted and standardized one and provisional diagnosis you should you should make a refer to cardiologist is also very important a key message is that any st of intake of as inhibitors will help to diagnose drug induced cough not not only as inhibitors there are certain other drugs also which can induce cough jeftinib uh, bisulfan uh, there are a lot of other chemotherapy medications also which can induce cough uh, uh, which can induce underlying lung disease uh, which can induce a lung disease which can induce ild all these things has to be ruled out so algorithm of any patient for any patient who presents with a cough for more than 2 weeks in india or history of contact with tuberculosis or any history of fever low grade fever with increase of temperature with weight loss and other conscious symptoms rule out tuberculosis if if you suspect uh, tb and if you ruled out tb after doing all the necessary investigation you should do a, 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 a sputum examination for acid phosphatase either one, one is direct sampling another one is early morning sample so spot sample and early morning sample two samples is enough nowadays so if you uh, rule out the tuberculosis after doing a good quality sputum examination then if it, if it is uh, if you rule out tuberculosis then think of other com common causes of chronic cough asthma upper respiratory cough syndrome grd and post infectious cough all these things has to be ruled out and uh, if you are not able to uh, you know uh, treat a case of chronic cough always always refer to refer refer to a specialist very important chronic cough is not an area for uh, general practitioners definitely chronic cough needs complete evaluation and uh they should uh, they they should refer these cases to a specialist so so these are the different trials what have been uh, uh, used uh, different uh, drugs they have used for chronic cough this is a trial on high dose acid suppression for a chronic cough a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial uh, the patients uh, that were included in this trial uh, were the patients with a chronic cough more than 8 weeks non smokers no asthma baseline 24 hour pa study was done methacholine challenge test was done laryngoscopy was done these group of patients were instituted with azomeprazol 40 mg twice daily dose that is a high dose versus placebo for 12 weeks the primary outcome they measured cough specific quality of life questionnaire so 39 to 45 percent of patients have a positive pa study uh, you could note from this uh, study but ultimately when you compare this to a group of patients those who got a high dose ppi that is protom inhibitor and those who got a placebo there is no absolute difference in the cough questionnaire between these two groups at the end of 12 weeks so what i am trying to tell is that use of proton pump inhibitors without any gross symptoms may not help you in all the cases so chronic cough once again work up good history taking as i already described so you should rule out all these things chronic cough Yeah, you should all always ask history of any drug intake like that can aggravate the cough, ACE inhibitors, sitagliptin, and history of smoking. You discontinue all these things. Even after this, also the patient presents with the cough uh, uh, after four weeks. Also, then try to rule out other causes also in addition to other uh, drug induced cough. So the commonest uh, scenario that you should rule out is upper airway cough syndrome, you know, second to rhinosinusitis. Consider sinus imaging. You can do a nasopharyngoscopy. You can do a uh, what else? You PNSV X-rays. all this thing allergy evaluation and empiric treatment can help in most of the cases asthma definitely for asthma we need a spirometry with bronchodilator reversibility confirmation of diagnosis in specialized centers you can do bronchial provocation test you can do a methacholine challenge test and all these things to confirm the diagnosis and allergy evaluation and one more entity a group of patients the chronic cough but history of allergy atopy history of other uh, features but a normal spirometry this group of patient we can call it as a non asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis the cough is because of eosinophilic deposition the airways lower airways so this they are called naeb and uh, they can be uh, diagnosed uh, with a sputum eosinophilia uh, we can do a pheno fraction of exhaled nitric acid facility is available and I, allergy evaluation empiric treatment can be offered and grd has to be suspected physiological testing for refractory patient can be done i have done for a couple of patients and initiate initiate treatment that that to high dose of proton pump inhibitor when you think grd is a cause for uh, you know uh, uh, cause for uh, your uh, chronic cough don't give once daily therapy uh, as you uh, already noticed in, in my last slide that uh, Uh, they used a twice daily dose that to esomeprazole as you know esomeprazole have a very good action up to 24 hours it suppresses the basal acid output even for 24 hours also uh, actually esomeprazole can be given one once daily only but uh, for cough for chronic cough second to grd if you think it is always better to give high dose twice daily dose will help for the patients up to 8 weeks and initiate treatment for all this treatment 
uh, things like if you think upper area consonant treat accordingly, if you think asthma treat accordingly, if you think NAEB, uh, you can give a trial of uh, inhaled corticosteroids and GRD, lifestyle changes and other things. But you know, cough due to GRD, even after giving a high dose, uh, this um, uh, high dose uh, protom inhibitor, uh, the patient will come back to you with a worsening cough. This is the common scenario of what we see in day-to-day -day practice. So further investigation, you should always do. If you think the GRD is a cause, 24-hour esophageal pH impedance monitoring has to be done. You can refer this patient for endoscopic and video fluoroscopic swallow evaluation. We can ask for a barium esophagogram and modified esophageal uh, barium solo. There are a lot of esophageal disorders, uh, esophageal disorders, and you can uh, you can do a barium studies, modified barium solo study esophagogram and all these things to rule out any retention of food substance which can increase the reflex. So that has to be noted. Sinus imaging, HRCT, if you think uh, uh, lung is a focus for this chronic cough, bronchoscopy and the other cardiac workup has to be done in some patients and uh, uh, environmental occupation has to be done and consider uncommon cause also. That's why if you think this as, uh, uh, as one of the cause for chronic cough, that's why you should always refer to a specialist. So think of all these red flags once again. So you should rule off this red flags. Any patient with uh, age more than 45 years, history of chronic smoking, history of hemoptysis, any history of hemoptysis has to be seriously considered. In India, any patient hemoptysis has to be ruled out, has to be ruled out tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis has to be ruled out for any patient hemoptysis. And uh, hosts of voice are any patient systemic symptoms or any patient with vomiting and recurrent pneumonia. Uh, once again, you should always rule out all these red flag signs and then proceed with your uh, management. Okay. Uh, when you compare this chest and ERS guidelines based on their uh, recommendations, so 2006 chest guidelines recommend speech pathology therapy. Speech therapy also plays a major role. So they, they, they will teach the patients how to uh, suppress their cough, how to hold the breath. They will uh, teach them the breath holding techniques, how to swallowing techniques. Other different techniques are there. You can refer to a speech specialist uh, for those patients who have some behavioral you know, uh, implications as one of the cause for chronic cough. Uh, both ERS and uh, CHEST recommends the speech pathology therapy. Inhaled corticosteroids, 2020 ERS guidelines, recommended use of inhaled corticosteroids that has to be prescribed uh, by a specialist after evaluation of all the other causes. And uh, this can be offered for all the patients with chronic cough. Inhaled corticosteroid may be given, may not be given for the patient with the cough. And gabapentin, <laughs> very important. Gabapentin is another common drug that has been used for uh, neuropathic pain. So we tend to use gabapentin, brigabalin, other uh, you know, centrally acting drugs for those patients who have a chronic cough. The dose, what we use, uh, maybe you can give a high dose of um, uh, therapy, but uh, you know, the problem with high dose gabapentin is that these patients will be uptended. These patients will have, a, you know, uh, they will they, they will feel giddy and they have some, uh, you know, sedation after giving high dose. So what is my usual way of practice is that any patient uh, with a chronic cough, uh, not settling out with any therapy, gabapentin, maybe I'll start with a low dose, 100 milligram per day. And then slowly every week I will increase 100, 100 milligram, maybe up to 1600, 800 milligram we can do. But I never gave 1600 milligram for any of my patient. Uh, maximum I used are up to 800,000 milligram. So you can give protopump inhibitors, but it is not mandatory. Both ERS and chest are very particular in that either plus or minus. Uh, depending on your, on your uh, you know uh, clinical experience you can choose morphine <laughs> morphine to prescribe a morphine actually in india it's not uh, freely available and uh, you should maintain a record for using all this morphine and all morphine nowadays we are using for patients who are uh, uh, getting a palliative therapy for malignancies particularly lung cancer and all if the patient is having uh, a chronic cough uh, with um, uh, underlying bronchogenic carcinoma or the patient is having a chronic pain uh, secondary to malignancies, uh, morphine is prescribed. But the morphine, you should always give low dose for this. You should always uh, give a slow release morphine only uh, to avoid other complications because uh, constipation is one of the complications. Uh, we can give 5 to 10 milligram slow release therapy, can be given twice daily uh, for uh, your patients. Morphine has been recommended in 2000 ERS guidelines. Uh, for patients with the chronic cough, whereas in chest guidelines, either you can give or you should not give. So once again, approach to the patient. This is a once again a repetition, acute and subacute chronic cough. You should classify, you should rule out red flags. After ruling out red flags by taking a meticulous history and clinical examination, then treat them symptomatically. If it is a chronic cough, you better refer to a specialist. Okay, ERS guidelines are the diagnosis and treatment of chronic cough. 
good history taking has to be done and examination has to be done at the time of presentation note the cough duration note the impact of cough on triggers take a family history of uh, you know any history of exposure and all these things and cough score usually a va the visual analog score a score that's the thing that what i showed in my previous slides uh, you can take a score of 1 to 10 and other quality of uh, life quality of life scores associated symptoms like uh, throat irritation chest and gastrointestinal lack symptoms associated with that any risk factors which can aggravate or underlying cough any history of intake of uh, ace inhibitors captopril lenalidopril and other drugs history of smoking history of sleep apnea all these things has to be noted definitely physical examination both upper respiratory and lower respiratory has to be examined chest has to be examined and uh, throat examination has to be done routine evaluation you can ask any patient with a chronic cough you can ask for a chest x ray uh, you can ask for a pulmonary function test if you think that infectious cause is not uh, one of the predominant uh, differential diagnosis in your uh, list uh pheno if facility is available but pheno is not standardized that's why uh, they have got a query because it has not been standardized yet even for asthma also we are not uh, recommending for all the patients only for those patients uh, like uh, uh, for whom we have a doubt in the diagnosis definitely pheno has to be added to the armamentorium of diagnosis blood count for eosinophils you can ask for a you know eosinophil count absolute eosinophil count Initial management, stop other risk factors, initiate corticosteroids, either oral or inhaled, but I prefer inhaled corticosteroid to avoid uh, side effects, to avoid adverse effects. You can prescribe LTRA, that is the Monte Lucast, particularly when uh, phenol and blood eosinophils are high, and initiate PPA only when peptic symptoms and evidence of acid reflux are very important. Only when peptic symptoms and evidence of acid reflux are present. But here, you could see LTRA is one of the commonly uh, prescribed drugs for cough uh, control. But I don't uh, think so. You should uh, you prescribe freely for this LTRA uh, because Vondilucos is one of the commonly misused drugs for chronic cough. And as you uh, all know that Vondilucos received a black box warning from FDA recently, just one year back, uh, because it can cause uh, serious neuropsychiatric symptoms, particularly in uh, uh, children. It can cause sleep disturbance in children. That's why uh, just uh, be cautious in prescribing Vondilucost and take a uh, uh, look at whether how far it is beneficial in your patient. And follow-up assessment of cough. Cough score has to be done and the quality of cough. And I think you should follow this practice. Then only you can assess clearly. And no improvement. Consider low-dose opiate. Uh, it is not possible. Uh, morphine and all is not possible in, in country like India. And consider pro motility agent. You can use sinitapride. You can put the mosapride. Uh, you can use the domperidone. Consider gabapentin, pregabalin, baclofen, uh, consider cough control therapy. Additional investigations, you can better refer to a specialist. You can ask for evaluation of hypospite attack. You can rule out uh, pulmonary tuberculosis as tuberculosis is one of the commonest cause for patients with chronic cough in India. Uh, you can do a sputum exam, a sputum for eosinophil count. Uh, many centers in India, we are not doing this. Ideally, we should always ask for a sputum for eosinophilia. And uh, bronchoscopy, uh, if if uh, clinically warranted, and high resolution CT scan, and also esophageal manometry in certain cases. So, which cough modulatory agents, pregabalin, gabapentin, tricyclopia, should be used to treat patients with chronic cough? So, based on the ERA secondary, we can recommend a trial of low dose slow release morphine, five to ten milligram twice daily in adult patients with chronic refractory cough. Usually, in patients with malignancy, I am just following this. Should anti-asthmatic measures, anti-inflammatory bronchitis can be used, uh, whether it can be used to treat patients with chronic cough? Yes, you can give a trial. There is no harm in giving a trial for uh, inhaled corticosteroids two to four weeks in adult patients with a chronic cough. Once again, it's a condi conditional recommendation, very low quality of evidence for this. Should pheno and blood eosinophil used to predict a treatment response to corticosteroids or anti leukotriene chronic cough? There is a need for convenient and practical test for predicting anti-inflammatory treatment response in patients with chronic cough, but Still, there is a lack of quality evidence. We, we uh, need a lot of placebo control trials to assess their utility, utility and also consensus recovered on pressure levels in patients with a chronic cough. So, I am summarizing all the facts what you have to uh, follow uh, for the management of cough. For any adult patients complaining of cough, we suggest that acute cough to be defined as any cough less than three to four weeks duration. For adult patients complaining of cough, Suggest that subacute cough can be defined as any patient three to eight week duration. For patients with chronic cough, the chronic cough can be defined as being any cough for more than two months or eight weeks in duration. For adult patients seeking medical complaining of cough, we suggest that estimating the duration of cough is one of the first step in narrowing our differential diagnosis. For adult patients around the globe complaining of cough, we suggest that 
cough should be managed using evidence based guidelines that are based upon the duration of cough don't prescribe lavishly all the unproven medications so i am concluding with this the classification management of acute subacute and chronic cough is based on the duration as proposed in the guidelines the cough may be treated empirically may not require aggressive investigation unless it is at this characters where red flag signs are which can persist which is persisting for more than 2 weeks pulmonary tb should be excluded if cough persists for more than 2 weeks after initial treatment of cystic symptoms and constitutional symptoms other signs of tb along with a cough for more than 2 weeks you should work out for tuberculosis upper airway cough syndrome grd cough variant asthma should be diagnosed based on the medical history and nasal examination and can be treated empirically referral should be considered for any patient for spirometry and other special lung function test or any patient with a persistent hacking cough or chronic cough not managed with all your usual protocols cough or cardiac origin should be suspected based on the history of cardiac illness use of angiotensin inhibitors beta blockers and amidrone and the presence of orthoprene and dyspnea has to be noted for all the patient and these patient has to be referred to a specialist as cough is one of the uh, earliest sign for the underlying serious disease environmental factors should be considered as one of the significant cause for chronic cough neonatal cough all the any patient any patient uh, or any neonates with a cough should be suspected for pneumonia uh, cough fever and recent history of travel to covid affected area or containment zone now we should think of covid 19 and with this extensive uh, you know discussion on cough so i am just ending my uh, you know uh, discussion any queries and clarification you can have a direct discussion thank you